All right, so today we're going to continue uh, chapter 14 on filters, or really active filters, uh, that include op amps. And uh, we're going to start transitioning to look at the actual analysis of the topologies of the actual circuits that are going to be congruent with the systems that we analyzed in the, in the previous lectures. And to start that, uh, we're going to look at the actual implementation of the two integrators uh, loop system that we discussed uh, in the previous uh, chapter, I mean the previous uh, lecture. And if you recall, uh, we had a circuit that we had identified the, the low pass response, the band pass response, the high pass response. Then we were uh, summing, subtracting uh, those from the input to generate the, the, the whole thing. And there, there were two integrators in there. So this topology that is shown here is an implementation of that. And just to take you back to the, let's see here. So just to take you back to that. So first, we can see uh, the second integrator here, OK? And this would be the first integrator. And then here, this resistor here and this one. And this amplifier here integrate the summing function. So I'm going to go through what we're going to do so I can change to the pad. And what is helpful is if you, if you have the book, then you can refer to this uh, figure while, while I'm doing that. But I'm going to talk about what we're going to do. So to analyze this, now that we have a topology, to analyze this circuit, we're going to use some technique of circuit analysis. It could be ad hoc. Uh, sometimes I use that. Uh, it could be nodal analysis, mesh analysis, loop equations, Kirchhoff's laws, um, or superposition. So in this case, what the most convenient thing to do is to, to use superposition. And if you recall, superposition, you solve for an active voltage source at a time, assuming that all the other voltage sources are replaced by their internal impedance, which since they are voltage sources is, is zero. And the thing to remember about the op-amp is that inside the op-amp over here, there is a voltage source reference to ground that is driving this node. Same here and so on. But these two, these two are integrators. So we, we can very easily uh, derive equations for that of the output based on the input. The one, the main one to, um, to derive uh, the main equation using the integrator equations as auxiliary. So we have a, a total number of equations in the system to come up with the transfer function for each uh, output of interest is this one, OK, here. And what we're going to see is that we're going to use superposition to derive the output here, which is the high pass response in terms of all the other available sources in the um, in the system, which are the band pass, the low pass response, and the input. And if we look at superposition and look at one of those at a time and ground the other one, uh, the other uh, sources, we see that for V in, this becomes a non-inverting amplifier where you are dropping the input voltage between 
uh, R3 and R2. For the band pass as an input, taking all the other sources to ground, uh, except of course the output, which is where you're trying to find the high pass, is going to be the another non-inverting amplifier where you are where the input is uh, the band pass response distributed uh, between R2 and R3 as a voltage divider. <clears throat> And then for the low pass, what we have is a classic inverting amplifier with uh, R1 and RF. So that's what I'm going to do next. And you know, the, the equations that I write will, um, will follow that thought pattern. Okay. Any questions? Uh, Dr. Hernandez, um, I think Caleb is the waiting room. Okay. All right. So, uh, any any uh, any questions? All right. So let me let me uh, switch to the pad and uh, do that exercise. Okay. So uh, so based on that figure, let's let's write that um, uh, that equation based on superposition. So this would be a circuit implementation. So we see here, remember, we are looking at what the output via superposition of the first op amp is. So that's the high pass response. So if we just look at the, at the effect or at the contribution of V in, as I mentioned, V in is a voltage divider formed by R3 and R2. And then to V in, that first uh, op amp looks like a non inverting amplifier. So that would be, that's the uh, feedback resistor and the input resistor. So that is the contribution. Now, the contribution of the band pass, so that's also another non-inverting uh, with a voltage divider form between R2 and R3, and then that's another non-inverting response. And then finally we have uh, the the low pass which is going through the inverting input of the op amp and that would be a inverting amplifier So this is the main equation uh, for that system. And then we have two auxiliary equations that are formed or given to us by the integrators. So those are that the bandpass response is also the integration of the high pass and that the low pass response is the it gives another integration and we have uh, three equations that now we can put together to give us a final equation for the whole system that includes all the different inputs so this is um,
So now we have V in and high pass only as the um, as the voltages in this equation, and we can solve for if we designate um, if we designate the high pass as our output, then we can uh, solve, and this gives us a transfer function for the high pass. But we have auxiliary equations. We can manipulate this equation to uh, substitute back the values for the low pass uh, and the band pass at a time, get rid of the high pass, and you know get the response for the band pass or low pass as, as we wish. OK? Now, one thing that would make this um, simple, if you look at the equation, we can look at how to simplify this topology because we have a lot of values. And uh, obviously, we're going to have some choices. And this is normally the case. You have, you have the fact that you can choose some values arbitrarily with some, you know, you have to make some wise decisions uh, based on other constraints that may not be expressed in an equation. It could be cost, it could be power dissipation, it could be uh, loading um, implications, uh, it could be availability of parts, you know, whatnot. So, but one one simplification uh, that could be made here, for example, is uh, you could make uh, the gain equal to one, okay? And if you look at this equation, and compare it to the system. So that, that's what I was talking about. You can compare it back to the system equation that we obtained last time that involve the, the values uh, such as K and Q. Then if you make the gain of the first amplifier one or RF or for the inverting case, uh, RF over R1, you make that one, then R3 over R2 will be 2Q minus 1. So that, that is a design equation. This part came from the system. This comes from the circuit analysis. And now you have a design equation because your Q is something that you want for your filter. So now this helps you choose R3 on R2. Another one that will come from this is that k will be equal to 2 minus 1 uh, over, over q. So then you can find your, you know, if you have your k, now you have another value, uh, another equation to, uh, to find out what, uh, what k needs to be. So, and, and to help you with the, this a system to circuit transition. Uh, so that that is a way to start looking at circuits and analyzing them uh, for for finding the values. Now let's let's take another look uh, and another implementation because you usually have one system formulation, but you can have different implementations that you go back and fit to the system and that you go back and reconcile with the system. So let me um, let me switch back. So let's talk about this implementation of a two integrator loop. And you can see a totally different, um, a totally different sort of topology. So here we have a an integrator that is, is damped here with its resistor. Uh, then here we have a Miller integrator, and here we have an amplifier. So, but it's still from a system perspective, this looks like the figure in the top. And we can then analyze this in the same manner to get uh, transfer functions uh, in S. So essentially, the Laplace transform of the um, input versus output. So 
another figure that is appropriate to discuss is the next one in the book so this is another this is another implementation of a, a two integrator loop so all these implementations are called biquad um, so given those those figures let's look at um, how to derive system equations and circuit equations uh, for them okay so if uh, if I go back to the first um, to that system that we saw and we saw a couple of different uh, implementations if we go back to that system I can denote the bandpass response um, as the bandpass output over the input and that is going to be if we go through the derivation I mean we've we done this before we're going to find out this bandpass response notice that the pole equation the denominator has not changed and uh, for the low pass we had this expression and uh, if you look at the circuit and we just fix the values of R and C to be common then we can say that for the integrators omega naught is 1 over RC okay so given this I can perform a similar analysis of those circuits and actually get an output versus input response and this would be in terms of the the actual components now This is another term in this numerator here. So that's the numerator, and and that would be the output, as as we denote the output, the um, the high pass response, and uh, the numerator is going to look the same. So notice that this is this is one this is a uh, one over RC is, is omega naught so it's in there and this is essentially omega naught square okay so you can you can the idea is you can get analyze come with uh, starting with the system and the topology analyze it and then reconcile it and get the component values involved in your response um, so and again 
by manipulating the zeros, so eliminating them from here and therefore in the topology, uh, you can then get different band selectivity. Uh, you can get the band, the, you can get the band pass, or you can get the uh, the low pass as well. Any questions? Is VL considered to be V low pass or is this the high pass? High pass, okay. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so you can also you can also um, get uh, active filters with a single op amp. Uh, that by the introduction of two capacitors or two reactive components, by the introduction of two of them, then you can get with a single op amp, you can get a second order system. So that is, um, that's acceptable to draw. So I'm going to draw that. because it's pretty pretty simple. So let's look at a band pass with a single op amp and two reactive elements or two capacitors so we can get a second order uh, and how we would we um, analyze that. So um, this would be band pass. And by the way, this is uh, figure 14.27, okay? So this topology uh, would look like this. Um, and here we have our V out and here we have a frequency selective network made out of two capacitors in the feedback path and here we have uh, a resistor in parallel there so I'm going to um, Call that R3, C1, and C2. And then the input is going to come through a R4. And the input is going to come into here between the two capacitors. So notice that I always use, you know, hopefully you can see that node. So you know that there is no connection there. That's just going over, okay? So we can start by analyzing this and the easiest way is to use a, an ad hoc approach. Uh, and the first thing that I can observe is that um, the op amp characteristic, right? The virtual, the virtual short across the inputs and the fact that there is no current going into the input. So that, that's a characteristic of the op amp. So here, since this is ground, the positive is ground, this point is um, zero volts, okay? So if, if that point is zero volts, then the current going here is V out, over R3, okay? Because there is also no current going into the input. So the, the current there is zero as well. And then if that is the case, then the current going in here through that branch there so that current there is going to be VO over R3 as well. 
So that current is VO over R3. It's the same one. Okay? And then I can figure what the voltage at that point is. I'm just going to call it X. And then the voltage at that point, let's call it VX, is going to be minus 1 S C look back at um, 2 R3 uh, times VO that's the voltage at that point And then the current there, the current going back in this branch over here, the current going there, so let's call it uh, the current through C1, that is going to be S C1 times VO minus VX. And finally, I have, I can calculate what the current is here, okay? So let's call it the current through, uh, through R4, and that's going to be VO so essentially is going to be uh, VO minus VX, which is the, the voltage across uh, C1 divided by R4. So now I have these two equations that I can use to come up with the, um, the transfer function because this current, this, this is also a current node over here and I know what the current is here and I know what the current is over here okay and uh, I know what the current is over here so I can put all that together as a as in an oil analysis equation to come up with a transfer function of VO over V in so if I put all that together I find that the transfer function is second order indeed uh, and this is a bandpass um, a bandpass circuit as we as we mentioned let me actually So the bandpass denominator would be So that's the denominator, and then the numerator would be the one zero 
for the band pass. So now, by doing that ad hoc analysis, I came up with a circuit, a circuit transfer function. But I know what the classic prototype for a second order system for the second order bandpass system is. We've been looking at that for since last time. And we said that that is also at the system level. Because Q and Omega naught are responses of the system of the filter that I want. And if I'm if I'm given if I'm given omega naught and q and k, then my job is to find out what the components need to be to realize that system response. So all I have to do is look at by inspection equate the coefficients. So here I have this coefficient here, the omega naught over q. That's going to be this guy here, okay? And I also have this term. So this is going to be uh, k omega naught over q. So I can see from that inspection, and that's what I want you to do, is come up with some equation for the system, come up with, for a, a transfer function for your topology, analyzing it, and then match it coefficient by coefficient. So if I look at these two equations and look by inspection, equate the coefficients, I can find out equations, design equations. These are the design equations that relate the component values to my system response. So if if I need to realize an omega naught for this bandpass filter, and I look at the coefficients of the system equation and the circuit equation, I know that omega naught is 1 over the square root of R4 C1, uh, R3 times R4 times C1 times C2. Then Q is going to be 1 over the square root of, because that's omega, and that's going to be divided by 1 over R3 times 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 which leaves me with k and k is going to be minus r3 divided by r4 and um, all that is going to be divided by 1 plus c1 over c2 so that comes from just looking at the two equations before and equating the, the coefficients. So I essentially have three equations and uh, four component values. So I have one degree of freedom. So I would have to reasonably uh, you know, pick one value. Or I could make some further simplifying assumptions, like uh, I could make um, the values of the resistors and the capacitors are the same, for example. But the point is that this will come from the response, the system response that I want. So I know what that is. I just don't know the component values, but now I have equations to, uh, to determine those. OK, any questions?
See if I can do another um, example. So let's look at uh, doing the same for a realization of this this time a high pass. So let's do a high pass, okay? And this time, um, let us just uh, remember a system equation for a high pass. So I can say. I'm going to do a second order high pass that is going to have two zeros at zero. So that, that is a high pass response for the second order. And then the poles are always the same for second order. So that is my system response. And now I want to realize this with the, this topology. So this is one that I, you know, creatively can come up with. You can come up with your own topology. There are many ways to implement it as long as you can match finally and, and verify that the response is there from the topology, the circuit analysis to the system. So let's look at, um, well, let me refresh this so I can draw because this one is also simple. It's a second order with two reactive, uh, components or two capacitors uh, so I can draw this reasonably well and a single op amp so I'm going to have here this is going to be V out and I'm going to have A resistor over here and a capacitor over here coming back to the positive input I'm going to call this R4 I'm going to call this C2 I'm also going to have another resistor here to ground I'm gonna call that R3 and then the input, we're going to feed it through a capacitor, which is going to be C1. So again, I, I, can, I can use ad hoc uh, techniques or observations. Uh, and the first thing that um, I can see is that because of the virtual short, this point over here, is VO okay so that that is the and if that is VO then the current through R3 is going to be VO over R3 there's so far just Ohm's law here and uh, Now, since there is no current coming in here, that current is zero, the current through C2 is the same as the current through R3. So now I have the current here is also VO over R3. And uh, I can figure then what VX is. I'm going to call that point VX again. And that that voltage that voltage is a voltage divider from vo so that is going to give me a voltage vx i'm going to write it here which is going to be vo times 1 plus 1 over S C2 R3 so that's my voltage Vs which uh, I can use to also calculate the current through R4 so the current through R4 is going to be VO 
divided by S, C2, R3, R4. And the current through C1 is going to be the addition of the current through R4 and the current through C2. So if I take those two together, I get that the um, that current, so that the current through C1 is going to be SC1 Vn minus Vo So essentially, that's the Vx term. So I can use I can use that analysis to come up. Now I have you know different equations such as Vx and the current through um, C1. I have equations that I can use to come up with a response for that circuit and relate it to the coefficients and the components. And that would be Remember, this was a high pass, so I have the double zero at zero. And there is another term in this uh, denominator, which is And again, you can do the same thing and get values for uh, for k, q, uh, omega naught. So get those values as functions um, of the components. And again, you you get three equations, and you have four unknowns. So you can you know you you can choose one value and start that process. Um, we can, so we did a, we, we did a low pass, now we did a, um, uh, no, we did a band pass first, and now we did a high pass, we can also do um, we can also do a low pass that's um, so we can that's going to be in um, in figure fourteen twenty nine I'll go back to that. Um, Let's, let's go back to figure 129. So this would be this would be a um, a low pass. So you can see that the um, we basically interchange the resistors and the capacitors in the topology, and he has gone from a high pass to a low pass. So we can do the the same analysis, and uh, which should be a good exercise for for you to do. And the important thing to remember is that now you start with your system prototype for for a second order 
uh, low pass, and you know that a low pass is an all pulse filter. So you have same uh, same pole equation. But then the zeros are at infinity, so what you have in the numerator for a second order prototype is k omega naught square. And if you go to the same uh, exercise, then you get that. your circuit uh, analysis equation for that specific uh, figure 1429 so this would be figure 1429 and it is a um, low pass And in the numerator, you have R1, which is uh, so 1 over the multiplication of all the components. So again, you can look at the, the, the methodology is always the same. Look at the, um, the coefficients, equate them, and you can get components from the system, uh, from the system parameters. Any questions about this? Yeah, a uh, quick question about the quality factor and omega naught. Why are they the same for all three types of filters? But as uh, John pointed out, the K was equal to a constant of one. So that comes from the prototypes. That comes from the from the prototypes of uh, of the system. That yeah, that comes from the prototype. So, any other questions? So we're actually going to be able to wrap up this chapter today and I'll assign homework later today that is going to be due in a week. So um, so that puts us no, uh, not so much behind, but um, still a, a bit behind. So the next topic that I want to talk about is, um, is switch capacitor filters. And uh, this is a very clever uh, technique. I think I have made a good case for why we really didn't want to have inductors and we came up with a, an inductor simulator that used resistance and capacitances and op amps. And I did say, you know, what we really have are, are really good transistors that we can make uh, amplifiers and we can make uh, we can make capacitors re reasonably well. Second from that, we can make resistors, not as good as capacitors, but we can make them. But the fact that what we really can do are transistors and capacitors lays down a motivation for getting rid of the resistors. Okay, and then. Uh, the question is, if I could get rid of the resistors, and furthermore, if I could use what I have to make resistors, and uh, what we're trying, what we're going to do is make a resistor out of uh, a capacitor. So let's uh, 
let's say that I have let's say that I have a box here and uh, I want this to look as a resistor but with a capacitor and here I have some voltage and here I have So I'm going to take a capacitor and going to put it there and ground it. And then VI is driving and driving VL. And this could be some type of load here. The question is, how do I make this box look like, like a resistor? And uh, if, I, if I drive VI, I'm going to get a current and charge that capacitor. So that, and we know that current is going to be, in this case, let's call this guy C1. Uh, So I'm going to get a current that is going to charge C1 and uh, I could, I could then take that current and that is stored, that charge that is stored in C1 and drive VL which is going to affect the current. So there's going to be an I in here and another I coming out here. And if I do that, I remember that the charge, the charge curve for the capacitor when I'm charging is going to look like this and when this charging is going to look like this. But if I could capitalize, if I could capitalize in the region, in the region of this curve that is over here, where it's linear for charging and discharging, that region, then I can say that that current, because it's, it's linear, is C1 delta V over delta T. Okay? And then I can solve I can solve for delta V over I as delta T over C1 but delta V over I is R. To the outside, that delta V that it sees at the terminals divided by the current that is going in and out is a resistance. Now, I still have to switch and get the current in, get the current out. So I'm going to get I'm going to get a switch, but I know how to make real good switches with transistors. So I'm going to open this transistor here and close this one, the first one, and charge C1. Then I'm going to open the first one Q1, let's call it, Q1, and close Q2 to charge and deliver that current to the load. The frequency at which I do that is delta T. So delta T 
is going to be one over f the frequency that I do that. So that is a very clever way of getting rid of a resistor by making a resistor with a capacitor and two transistors. Uh, I'm actually going to add later two more transistors to make sure that I fully discharge C1 before putting charge in and that I, that I can effectively control that node. So that's, that's just uh, another refinement for a straight capacitance, but this is the very fundamental uh, way of uh, implementing a switch capacitor and resistance. And we can then use uh, this, what is inside the box, we can use it in place of a resistor and we can get rid of all the resistors. Of course, that I need digital logic now to generate the switching of the transistor. So let's call it that this is going to be a phase of a clock, and this is going to be another phase because they have to be non-overlapping phases of a clock, but that's fine. That's just more transistors, which they're very inexpensive. I'm just trying to get rid of the resistor. So that is the, um, the clever technique of switch capacitors um, resistance that I can use in filters. Another, another way of looking at it, okay, is that the, the charge in the capacitor is going to be the capacitance times the voltage. Now, the current is not going to be the big difference which is, it amounts to, to nothing really because it doesn't matter. Uh, the difference is that the, uh, the current is not going to be constant. It's going to be pulsed into the capacitor, out the capacitor, in and out, in and out, like, like, like a pump. So I have to, to think in terms of my current is really going to be an average to be equated to the uh, resistor is going to be an average. So that average current is that Q is another way of looking at it over the period of the pumping of the charge. And the, the resistance equivalent, again, if you do solve for V, v in divided by the current, then that is the equivalent resistance. which is equal to what I had before for, I call that delta T, the TC I call it delta T over C1 or uh, one over the um, the switching frequency over um, times C1. So that's a, that's a very clever technique. Let's just uh, wrap it up. And this is what we use in integrated circuits of analog, uh, of analog circuits. So you can do active filters with resistors very nicely uh, in board level design, and you don't have to use uh, inductors. That's very nice. You, don't, you want to avoid inductors uh, whenever you can. They're always bulky and expensive, but for doing filters inside a chip, even the resistors uh, are a complication that you don't want. If you can 
do switch capacitors instead, that's the way to go and what is done uh, in practice for filters that are integrated as part of a bigger system on a chip. So let's just look at um, some pictures as, as we wrap this up. So here's an idea of a Miller integrator, of a Miller integrator where we have replaced the, uh, the resistor with a switch capacitor. And you can see and it works exactly the same. And you can see that during the first phase of the clock, during the first phase of the clock, the capacitor charges when the first transistor is, uh, is closed and the other one is open. And then when the first transistor is open and the second one is closed, you transfer the charge to the other part of the circuit, the load at that node. And here you can see the, your period of switching and uh, the two non-overlapping uh, phases of the clock. Because you cannot have both transistors closed at the same time. So you need to basically non-overlap them to make sure that they are, uh, they can be open at the same time, but not closed at the same time because then you will have charge sharing and, and that will basically destroy the, uh, the mechanism. And we can add uh, a refinement of uh, these two transistors here, this one and here, to essentially, when we open, when we open uh, and we are delivering the current, we basically ground that node to make sure that the charge flows out of the transistor. I mean, out of the capacitor, and when we are charging, and this one is closed, we also close this one to make sure that that's, this node is grounded to effectively charge the capacitor. So that's a, um, a further refinement. Uh, it causes another two transistors, which is fine. So this would be an actual implementation of it, the two integrator uh, loop active filter that we just uh, went through deriving. But now instead of resistors, we have uh, switch capacitors. So if you were going to um, if you were going to design that filter on a board, you would use this. No inductors, very nice, just resistors and capacitors, but if you were going to do it on a, on a chip, you would do this. Same results, just that the resistors have been uh, replaced by uh, a capacitor and four transistors, just to make sure that we have uh, uh, the best charging and discharging out of the capacitors. But you can see how we simply have um, replace those uh, resistors with switch capacitors. And then you would come up and calculate according to the resistance equivalent that you need, the frequency and the capacitance that you need. And once you have that frequency, all you have to do is uh, implement the logic to generate, uh, which is very simple to generate uh, the two phases of the, of the clock. So of course, this one is going to need some control logic somewhere here, which is fine. So that's, uh, that's how you would do a two-order um, a two-order filter in, uh, in an integrated circuit. And then you could use those filters in, for example, an analog to a digital converter and build bigger systems and things like that. So when you buy a, an A to D chip, you have stuff like this inside with op amps and, and things like that, op amps that only use transistors as we'll see in the second uh, half of the course for the integrator circuits.
So that that concludes uh, chapter 14.